Hello everyone. So this is one of the, the big ones, uh, this video today, uh, the evolution of MacMed. I'm going to be spelling it this way because of that is the way it's, it's worded in many of the inscriptions and on coins and so forth. So we're going to be looking at um, the Bible where we see the root of this word in the Bible. We're going to see the earliest inscriptions from it that we currently are aware of and we're going to see how it gradually evolved over time and um, how it was written in the Quran, um, what the original meaning was and how that evolved into the 8th century. So we're looking at the big picture and uh, in the process we'll make some observations and perhaps suggestions in terms of what happened. I think there's certainly an argument that there there has been a Gnostic reworking of the original meaning of the Quran, um, the original being hidden and the the new meaning being connected to um, the Arabian prophet, inverted commas. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. Now, Hamad is the Hebrew root of Mahmed. It means desired, and here are two occurrences of it, Psalm 68, 16 and Proverbs 12, 12. As you can see, uh, it's a translation which God has desired for his abode. In the Quran, this is rendered Ahmed. We also see Mahmed in its plural form in the Old Testament. For example, Song of Songs 516, uh, Mahmedim, and uh, credits to uh, Robert Kerr, Professor Robert Kerr on this one. Um, and this term was associated with the Messiah. Again, similar meaning to the one that we had before, desired, lovely, um, praiseworthy. Um, we, could, we could use a whole range of pseudonyms, or not pseudonyms, we could, um, synonyms even, uh, for, that, for that word. Okay, but the key thing is it was associated with um, the Messiah. Okay, now Christians would also interpret it as referring to Jesus. Okay, um, <clears throat> so therefore it has a kind of a reference to Jesus as well, and obviously the concept of the Messiah is linked there as well. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now instances where Mahmed is used in the historical record. So, 518 AD, 6th century, this is a dedication stele commemorating the conquest of the Christian city of Najran by the Jewish king Yusuf of Himyar, which contains praises to their God for their victory. Okay. And here it is in context, so you see the, the wider inscription there. Now you notice that the, the bit that concerns us is underlined there in red, which in Sabaic reads Mahmed. Um, this was found in situ in Bir Hima, uh, Najra'an, Saudi Arabia. And you can see that Rab had been Mahmed, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, by the Lord of Jews, by the highly praised. Clearly, the highly praised refers to God. So this is praising God for, for their victory. It seems likely that Christians borrowed this phrase for God, the highly praised Mahmed, and used it for Jesus slash God in the 7th century. Okay. Now we can see um, here um, the Sabaic of Mahmed, reading it from right to left. Okay. Why would both Mahmed and a cross appear on the same coin in the 7th century? Mahmed refers to Jesus, the praised or desired one. These coins reflect a Christian rather than a Muslim milieu still in the 7th century. This is dated to 686, 687 AD. Now, when we say Christian here, we're obviously including in that... Uh, Christian heretical groups potentially. Um, there are plenty of examples of crosses there, but the key thing there is that underneath we have the word Mahmed. Okay. 
Here's another example on credit to Odin Lafontaine for this coin. Again, we can see very clearly numerous crosses and the word Mahmed. This is dated sometime between 679 and 691 AD. And here's another coin. Um, it has a fish symbol, which obviously um, is a symbol of Christianity. And it also has Mahmed underneath. Um, and this is from Bet uh, Shean, mid 7th century. Uh, credit is Thomas Alexander for this coin. So we can see again association of Christianity with Mahmed. Um, this kind of goes against the standard Islamic narrative, the idea that um, Islam had taken over and uh, Islam was against the cross and so forth. It's, so what, you know, if we just look at the evidence in it, on its own terms, there's an association between Christianity and Mahmed here. We see here both a cross and Ma'avia. Um, and in Arabic, that would be Mu'awiya, servant of God, Abdullah, and Amir al Mumin, commander of the believers. So you can see it in the inscription there, it's inside the green box there, is where you find the cross. Okay, um, you can see Mavia there. It's interesting that while it's rendered in Greek letters, they, they have kept to its original form, it hasn't gone into the Arabic, Arabic form of the name, so this would be a name that would be typical within Syria. Okay, we had Queen uh, Mavia a few centuries before, who was obviously a Christian um, queen. Okay, um, now there's additional clues that would suggest that uh, Ma'avia or Mu'awia, uh, to use the Arabic form, uh, was a Christian or some type of Christian, perhaps a heretical Christian, but um, definitely a Christian. If we if we take this evidence um, on face value here, um, now. If we're not convinced by that, then if we look at the Maronite Chronicle, um, it gives us supporting evidence that he actually he was some form of Christian. It says, in, in that year, many Arabs gathered at Jerusalem and made Muawiyah king. And he went up and sat down on Golgotha, which is obviously the place where Jesus was crucified. He prayed there and went to Gethsemane. Right, uh, and went down to the tomb of the Blessed Mary to pray in it. Now, all of those things fit with the profile of him as Christian and not with the standard Islamic narrative that would paint him as Muslim. He, he sat down in Golgotha, which would suggest he at least believes that Jesus was crucified. Otherwise, why would he sit down there? Why would he go to the various places associated with Jesus' death and even, you know, where Jesus prayed the night before he was crucified, um, and also the reference then to Mary as well, um, who uh, was reverenced for centuries um, as the mother of God. Um, so uh, this all fits in with the, the idea of him being a Christian. Now, it goes on elsewhere to say he placed his throne in Damascus and refused to go to Mahmed's throne. Now, because I've been, uh, my eyes have been filtered by the standard Islamic narrative, as it were, I just assumed that this Mahmed's throne referred to somewhere to do with Muhammad. Was it to do with Mecca or somewhere like that? Or was it Medina that's been referred to? But actually, a throne is somewhere where you sit. Um, Ma'awiya sat down on Golgotha, which would suggest this is the throne of the Mahmed, Jesus. Okay, so he was made king there, but he chose to rule from Damascus. So this is really what I think the text is actually trying to get at. He's pl he placed his throne in Damascus and refused to go to Mahmed's throne. Okay. Um, so, okay, he did sit down there, but he didn't, 
he wasn't so um, impertinent to actually set up his uh, kingship and rule from Jerusalem there, you know. So that's how I w- would read it. What do you think? Um, I think that kind of makes sense of, of the text. It would be lovely if the text went further and said, in inverted commas, Jesus. Perhaps the term has been used just for those who are heretical. Um, and maybe other Christians didn't um, like the association of Mahmoud with Jesus, maybe. Um, but he didn't spell it out fully. But we kind of maybe drew draw an inference maybe from the two passages when we put them together and actually uh, when we look at the coins uh, with the crosses I think it's pretty obvious that Mahmoud here is referring to Jesus okay now um, so the Maronite chronicle is an anonymous analytic chronicle in the Syriac language completed shortly after 664 AD so it's contemporary so we're talking only four years after the events. Um, and if everything is hunky-dory, I think it's a reliable source. Um, now, obviously, uh, a lot of this um, depends on if everything is legit. And there's, um, we have to examine later whether um, chronicles such as this can be relied upon. If there's, you know, we always have to be on our guard with um, perhaps things written later than what they seem, but it seems to be legit as far as we know. So either way, I think it's a fair it's a fair suggestion to say that uh, based on even the, the earlier inscription here and the coins that Mavia or Mavia um, was indeed a Christian of some kind. Okay? Perhaps a monophysite, okay? Now, um, next we'll look at the Quran. The Quran has been reworked, edited, and reinterpreted to fit the later narrative. Okay, I think we all gathered that at this stage. The Sana manuscript is an obvious um, piece of evidence where we can see earlier writing of the Quran that was very different to the later text. So I think it's that really proves the case. the case of course the standard islamic narrative would describe the the hamlet set underneath as just simply the companions codices which is just a nonsense story to explain away the fact that the text actually was re-edited over time okay so as i said the sanam manuscripts reveal reworkings of the text of the quran According to Stephen Shoemaker, the Quran was assembled under Abdul al-Malik, and I, I would concur with that, which would date its earliest form to the late 7th century and early 8th century. I think that fits with the data that we have. Um, it's not to say there were... It was probably based on earlier texts, um, which were, you know, could be radically different from what it ended up as in the Quran. Um, and some of these earlier texts, no doubt... We're in Arabic, not just Ar- in Aramaic, and not just Arabic. Um, so we have a, a Quran sometime in the late seventh century, early eighth century, and then this got reworked. Okay, it seems likely that the earliest manuscripts we have are from the eighth century. Okay, that's that's where we we kind of stand on that one. Despite successive reworkings, we still have enough to see what the first writers meant by. Mahmed. Okay, now a credit to Saint Murad for some of this here. The Quranic writers, when referring to Mahmed, originally meant Jesus. Surah 47, verse 2 And those who believed and did righteous deeds and believed in what has been sent down upon uh, Muhammad, okay, and it is the truth from their Lord, removed from them their sins and amended their condition. Okay, now I'm going to suggest that actually what was there, what was meant by Mahmed here was Jesus. Now let's look at it again. Those who believed and did righteous deeds and believed in what has been sent down upon Jesus and it is the truth from their Lord 
removed from them their sins and amended their condition. When did Jesus remove their sins and amend their condition? Or the people amended their condition in response to Jesus? Well, we have Matthew 2.10. Jesus says, But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Uh, Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So totally fits in the context. Um, now let's have a look at this one. Who are the those and the him in the gospel? Okay, so we have Surah 48, verse 29. We have Muhammad, messenger of Allah, and those with him. Okay, so those with uh Muhammad, okay, are forceful against the disbelievers, merciful among themselves. You see them bowing and prostrating, seeking bounty from Allah and his pleasure. Their mark is on their faces from the trace of prostration. That is their description in the Torah. And their description in the gospel is as a plant which produces its offshoots and strengthens them. So they grow firm and stand upon their stalks, delighting the sowers. Now, the description in the in the gospel is... Well, there's various parables, but parable of the sower, the parable of the seed, and so forth. That's describing the followers of the gospel who are Christians. So who is the those there? It's obviously the disciples, the Christians. Okay. So that Allah may enrage by them the disbelievers. Allah has promised those who believed and did righteous deeds among them forgiveness and a great reward. Okay. So we can see here that it is Jesus here who's the Mahmed, messenger of Allah, and those with him are forceful against the disbelievers. So now it makes sense. Okay. Um, that is their description in the Torah. The followers of God, the believers in God, you have um, their faces are marked from prostration. Well, one example of that would be in the Torah, Moses bowing down on the ground. And then in the gospel, uh, the reference to the, the sower, okay? Um, later, the phrase messenger of Allah was given the interpretation prophet of God. This is how, I'd say 99% of people, when they see, let me just go back a slide, they see messenger of Allah, they think of Muhammad, and they, they think that messenger of Allah is referring to him as a messenger of God, so in other words, a prophet okay prophet of god now here we actually need to reconsider the passage okay the hebrew word translated as angel is malak and it simply means messenger okay so the reference to the messenger of allah may be a reference to the enigmatic figure of the angel of the lord okay so let's be clear malak in hebrew has two meanings it means angel and messenger okay um so let's just explore this idea that maybe when it says Mahmed, messenger of allah it actually means jesus the angel of the lord but this has all been arabized okay so let's have a look um, at some bible passages now, what's interesting about all the ones that we're going to look at, they are all really important for Arabs. There's one that we're going to see to do with Hagar. There's one that's going to be to do with Abraham and another to do with Moses. So these are central passages that can't be avoided. So here, here's the first one. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my, my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Now who's talking? The angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is saying to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants. Now is that an angel? That's talking to her. Can angels say, I will greatly multiply your descendants? Is that part of the power of an angel? I would say no. Um, the context there 
is actually suggesting something else, okay? Uh, and many Christians would interpret it to, to mean Jesus. It's a, a, a prefigurement of Jesus in the Old Testament or, or just simply interpret it as meaning a, um, God, okay? So the angel of the Lord is reference to um, an appearance of God in the, in the Old Testament, okay? Now, an objection that could be made is um, what you find in the Quran is Rasul. Um, now, the Hebrew Malak has its equivalent in Arabic, um, Malak, meaning both angel and messenger. Okay, but the Quran uses the word Rasul. What, what about Rasul? Okay, we often see it translated as messenger. The Quran itself shows it has both meanings also. So even though the Quran uses Rasul rather than the Arabic Malak, we're still on solid ground by claiming that the word Rasul here can actually mean angel and not just messenger. Okay, don't believe me? Here is an example of it being used. Okay, so Rasul is singular. Ruslun, that's the plural form of it. Both translations identify that it has the double meaning angel and messenger. So you can see here... In the passage, this is from Surah 737. Let's read the whole thing. But you'll see that they didn't know which one to go for, which meaning. So they basically put both meanings down. Messenger angels. This is from um, Dr. Mustafa Kitab, the Clear Quran. And the other one is Sahih International. So these are really famous translations. Okay. So, you know, if they were trying to hide this, they made a bad job of hiding this. They mustn't have thought that this is important here. But in any case, let's let's read the passage, uh, the translation. Who does more wrong than those who fabricate lies against Allah or deny his revelations? They will receive what is destined for them until our messenger angels arrive to take their souls, asking them, where are those false gods? you used to invoke besides Allah, and they will cry, they have failed us, and they will confess against themselves that they were indeed disbelievers. So you can see here the messenger angels are really angels. You can't just say they're human beings, they, they are actually angels, it's clear. So we're on solid ground by saying that uh, messenger of Allah could also be translated as angel of Allah, or even, to bring it back to its biblical influence, and base and origin, angel of the Lord. Now, um, so in relation to um, Hagar's descendants, an angel can't multiply Hagar's descendants. It is interesting to note that this messenger of God gives Hagar a promise based on his own authority. He tells her, I will multiply your descendants. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees, for she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Bir Lahe Ruwa. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Barad. Genesis sixteen thirteen to 14 Hagar recognizes that she is speaking to divinity and is even surprised that she is allowed to live after seeing him. Okay? Now, the problem... For Muslims and for the writers of the Quran is um, by associating, associating Mahmud with the phrase angel of the Lord they're now they've now got a problem on their hands because they're the, the text is, is clearly indicating that the angel of the Lord is God and if they put Mahmud Jesus next to that it's it's actually arguing the text itself is actually arguing very strongly for the identification with uh, Mahmed and God. In other words, Jesus and God are one and the same. That's the problem. Okay. So they're going to have to argue against the obvious meaning, which is that it really does mean angel of the Lord is, is God. And they're going to have to go against it and say, oh, well, it just means an angel. Okay. Okay. So the ne next passage is... Abraham and the angel of the Lord, Genesis 22. The next time we see the angel, Abraham and Isaac are on their way up Mount Moriah to make a sacrifice. 
Isaac doesn't know that he is going to be the sacrifice. God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, and Abraham is heading up the mountain to show his obedience. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So who is the me? Angel of the Lord is saying this from me, so it's clearly to do with God. Okay? Okay, so the angel of God says, you have not withheld your son from me. Remember, God is the one that asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. When the angel stops him, he acknowledges Abraham's compliance by referring to God in the first person. You have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. If the angel of God was just an angel, he should have said from him, as in from God. But it's from me, okay? Hope that's clear. And now the third example. Exodus 3.2 The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvellous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Literally, the angel of the Lord appears in all of the crucial texts of interest to the Arabs to do with, Ab- to, to do with Hagar, Abraham, and Moses. Okay, that's obviously not in the biblical text. That's my explanation. So you can see, again, angel of the Lord appears in the blazing fire, and then we see that um, go, the, the Lord is mentioned, and God called to him from within the bush. Where is the angel of the Lord? In the blazing fire, from the midst of a bush. So it's clear again from the text that the angel of the Lord is God. Okay, so we've got three examples. Angel of the Lord clearly identified as God. Okay. So therefore, the Quran is identifying Muhammad or Mahmed, i.e. Jesus, with the angel of God or angel of the Lord, i.e. God. So that's what's really kind of crucial there okay so where you see messenger of Allah really you could say uh, the angel of the of the lord or simply jesus god okay might as what well, the Quran might as well just say jesus is god that's what it's actually saying um that creates problems okay now in the reinterpretation of the Quran they have got to change this they're going to have to uh, reinterpret this angel of the lord to mean just an ordinary angel and not um and not god um it it might also su- suggest that they will have to treat jesus as just a, an angel and not really a human being that can be crucified as well so that will be another part of the reinterpretation of the original quranic text so you can imagine um when this was being um, put together under abdul al-malik um, they've got all of these theological loose ends uh, which don't fit with the new narrative. And um, um, so even when the text was more or less complete, how you read the text and how you interpret it would have to be controlled so that people see it in a certain way with a certain meaning. That's all part of the standard Islamic narrative. Okay, But if we peel back all that uh, accretion, we can actually see... The original sense of it, the text okay so the implications of this originally the Quranic writers were wrestling with the idea that Jesus is divine even while saying that Jesus is a mere warner the terminology used for Mahmed is drawn from a tradition that has interpreted differently that he is divine this makes some sense if Mahmed is Jesus but no sense if they meant an Arab prophet Mahmed can also be used in the sense of blessed is or blessed be the angel of the Lord. Okay. The interpretation of 
the angel of the Lord as being God is a dilemma for the Quranic writers because sometimes the Bible refers to angels as just angels. So they are at pains to say Jesus is but an angel. However, key biblical texts to do with Hagar and Abraham present the angel of the Lord as God. This is a problem for them and requires reinterpretation to avoid this implication. So they basically are doing mental gymnastics, theological uh, convulsions to try and avoid the obvious. So this interpretation is supported by this other ayah, um, Surah 48, verse 29. Jesus said, Indeed, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wherever I am, and has enjoined upon me prayer and zakah as long as I remain alive. Um, And we can see how that's connected with Psalm 113, verse 2. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay. So as we saw in the other other one there, uh, blessed be the angel of the Lord. Um, Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's all uh, fitting, a kind of a type. Okay. Again, we are justified in seeing Mahmed as referring to Jesus originally. So, Surah 3340, Muhammad was not the father of any of your men, but Allah's messenger and seal of the prophets, and Allah was of everything knowing. Now, in the Arabic, it's just simply Mahmed, but we have followed the standard Islamic narratives vocalization of Muhammad here. Okay, so Muhammad was not the father of any of your men. Now, this is um, Murad's uh, reflection on it. The Arabic here means was not, not, is not. Therefore, it is speaking of a past event. This is a reference to Jesus, who really was not the father of any of the men. He wasn't married, he didn't have a wife, etc. Jesus was the seal of the prophets, okay, because public revelation ended with him. Seal up the prophets means like, okay, the prophet's work is done. He, he is the ultimate revelation. He is the word become flesh. That's, you know, that's another way of putting it. The ultimate revelation of God. Okay. So if you put the word Jesus in there, it makes perfect sense. Okay. Jesus was not the father of your men, but Allah's messenger. Allah's angel. Okay. So Allah's messenger It has two meanings, angel and messenger, okay? So Allah's or God's angel, so reference to angel of the Lord, all of the the, um, appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament, okay? Uh, These prefigure the incarnation, okay? Um, Now, we can see that a phrase used explicitly about Jesus, example, not but a messenger, is elsewhere elsewhere used for Mahmed. Okay, so we see here Surah 5, verse 75. The Messiah, son of Mary, is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. Okay, keep that in mind. So we're using, or we're seeing the phrase in the Quran, not but a messenger, used explicitly for Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, look at it here. We see clearly Muhammad or Mahmed, is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. This is Surah 3144. Let's go back to the other one again. So here we have Muhammad is not but a messenger, or Mahmed is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. We have here the Messiah, son of Mary, is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. It's the exact same phrase, all that's different is in one place we have the Messiah and the other Mahmed. Okay? So I think it's really clear Mahmed is a reference to the Messiah. We we saw earlier on that in the Bible Mahmedim had been used for centuries as a reference to the Messiah as well. Okay? So this if you're a Muslim watching this, this should be a wake up call. This maybe is the first time you've actually grasped that you've been lied to. You've 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 been told the standard Islamic narrative, but this is actually provable 
what you're seeing now, okay? You're seeing that Mahmed was originally a reference to Jesus. There's only four references to Mahmed in the Quran plus Ahmed, and these all relate to Jesus, the Messiah, okay? We need to make a logical inference. If Jesus is not but a messenger, and if Mahmed is not but a messenger, then clearly Jesus is Mahmed. We're not talking about Mahmed, the Arabian prophet, but Jesus is Mahmed in the sense of the Messiah, as, as you find in the Bible, the praised one, the desired one. Okay. My personal opinion is that the question of what was meant by Jesus being the angel of God was never fully resolved. Okay. It was an issue that was being argued about. Okay. Some thought it meant just an angel, therefore he was a mere warner. Okay. I do believe the, the idea that the, the Quranic text is not just from one author. It's, a, it's a, a number of authors. So there's kind of, that's why you have contradictions between different passages. Okay. Some thought it meant he was divine. And this is carried on especially through the Sufi traditions. And it is unmistakable that they see Muhammad as divine. Now, um, to show you that, so we, we basically said um, some thought it meant he was divine. And this carried on especially to the Sufi traditions. Let's look at the evidence for that. Okay. God's light united with Muhammad's body before the creation of the world. Yeah? <laughs> Muhammad is divine according to the Sirah. Don't believe me? Let's just read it here. Long before the creation of the world, God took a ray of light from the splendor of his own glory and united it to the body of Muhammad. Now here, perhaps the body of Muhammad is the spiritual body of Muhammad, perhaps. But in any case, goes on. Thou art the elect, the chosen. I will make the members of thy family the guides to salvation. Mahmed said, The first thing which God created was my light and my spirit. Okay? So you see how they are presenting Mahmed as divine. Here's a picture from 1540 AD. Okay? You can see that the light of Mahmed is shining. He's obviously been depicted as divine with a, a veil hiding his his face because God God's face cannot be looked on in the Old Testament. Um, the indication was if you looked at God's face, you would die with from fear or whatever, you know. So it seems to have survived into the Sufi traditions. Okay, so even if you doubt. What I'm saying about the idea of Mahmed being originally a reference to the Messiah and to Jesus, the proof is in the Sufi traditions. You can still see that they're treating Mahmed like Jesus, as a divine being. So they've, they've, there's some awareness there of the original um, sense, even though a large part of the Islamic tradition is still going for the idea that uh, Mahmed is just an, an Arabian prophet who's just human. Okay, but what type of human would it be um, in the Shahada where you have to declare that Allah is one and that Mahmud is his messenger? Why, why is that there? Why should he be included in this divine declaration? Okay, see the problem? It makes sense that they actually, in the early tradition, had a concept of Mahmed as a divine being. Somehow it got transferred to this Arabian prophet, and but they've been struggling with that sense of the divinity there ever since. Here's some more evidence. Okay, Muhammad, the Muhammad of pre-existence, was created of divine light when he stood as a column of light before God for a million years in primordial adoration, God created Adam from the light of Muhammad. Or according to another passage of the Tafsir, he created Adam from the clay of divine might, from the light of Muhammad. Okay, so there's plenty of these. Um, here's another. 
Not only Adam is formed from Muhammad's light, but the whole universe participates in this emanation of light. The light of the prophets is from his light, and the light of the heavenly kingdom is from his light, and the light of the world and of the world to come is from his light. This is just like straight out of um, Christian theologians talking about Jesus, isn't it? The spiritual masters and divinely desired and the spiritual disciples and God seekers also take part in this successive light emanation, though there are two somewhat different parallel passages concerning the source of this emanation of light. In the tafsir, the divinely desired directly emanate from Muhammad's light, while the God seekers issue from Adam's light. Okay, I won't go into any further, but you get the point. In the Kitabi Awal El Ki Amat, we read the following singular account. It is recorded by tradition that God first created a tree with 4,000 branches and called it the tree of life. Then he created the light of Muhammad. And in a veil of white pearl, which incidentally is a symbol for Jesus, as we've seen before in the Syrian traditions, of the shape of a peacock and placed it upon that tree where it praised him for 70,000 years. Now, back to Ahmed. Ahmed and, and Mahmed share a common root, as we saw. Here is Ahmed referred to in um, Surah 61.6. And remember Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah. I am the angel of the Lord, as we can, we can see now. Sent to you, confirming the law which came before me and giving glad tidings, good news of a messenger to come after me, an angel to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. So it's, it's all a bit confused here. Um, now, I would suggest that actually they're taking the idea of when Jesus said about the second coming, he will return again, and now they've changed him into someone else. Okay? So they're a bit confused here. Okay? But... Now that we know that Mahmed and Ahmed are actually the same person, Jesus, it kind of makes more sense, but it's kind of distorted. Then it goes on to say, but when he came to them with clear signs, i.e. miracles, they said, this is evident sorcery. Now, we have that in the Gospels, you know, where the Jews accused Jesus of sorcery for being able to do miracles. Okay, does this make sense? Mahmed, Ahmed and Jesus, according to the Quran, are one and the same. They are the Messiah. Okay. So Hamad is the Hebrew root of Mahmud. It means desired. Hence why Ahmed is the alternative name of Muhammad in the Quran. Okay. So we saw this earlier on. So in the Quran, this is rendered Ahmed. So Hamad, Ahmed. We also need to recognize a certain Arabization has occurred. So in that inscription we saw earlier of Ma'aviyah, okay, that became Mu'awiyah in the Arab, Arabic. Mahmed became vocalized as Muhammad, making him very much like an, an Arabian prophet and not, it's not obvious now once you turn it to Muhammad, that is actually in any ways linked with Mahmed or Mahmedim or um, Hamad, as you find in the Bible. Okay. Now, perhaps, um, and this is something I had a discussion with Lloyd de Young about, is perhaps the vehicle for this change was a Gnostic one, where the original meaning gets um, hidden and then a superficial meaning is placed onto the original. Um, so you have this um, story of an Arabian prophet, um, and this is the this is the wrapping around the box. But when you take off the wrapping, open the box inside, you find that it's actually really about Jesus. Okay, that's the, but not the Jesus as of the Gospels. Really, it's the Gnostic Jesus. Okay, who is not uh, the incarnation of God, but just merely an angel um, who doesn't have a body. Um, who can't be crucified because he, he doesn't have a physical body. Um, that's the, the sense 
that seems to be coming true. Okay. Now it is clear that Mahmud came before Muhammad in terms of uh, you know etymology. Um, from Mahmud, we get Macometus in Latin for Muhammad. Okay, and this is something from uh, Dr. Robert Kerr, who spoke to us a number of, of weeks ago. In French, we get Mahomet. Okay, All right. So we can see here that we can get all of these from the root of Mahmud, okay? We can get all the versions of Muhammad from Mahmud, but we can't from Muhammad. It doesn't work etymologically to go from Muhammad to Mahmud, but it does work from Mahmud to all of these, okay? Um, and uh, I would definitely agree with uh, Professor Robert Kerr on this. I think um, that's, that alone uh, confirms a lot of what we said about the way the tradition uh, morphed into the 8th century and Mahmed got vocalized into Muhammad and all the rest of it. Okay. But it's amazing that um, how how much of the original tradition with uh, Mahmed going into Mahmet, you know, um, and Mahometus in Latin and Mahomet in French. Okay. It's amazing how it somehow, despite us using Muhammad and Muhammad and so forth today it's actually we can see that for centuries they were using the original okay so with all that said and done the conclusion I would give is Mahmed functioned both as a reference to God to Jesus and was used as a messianic uh, epithet it was applied to God in the sixth century Jewish inscription that we saw it applied to Jesus in the 7th century coins, obviously with a, um, a certain messianic flavor to it as well. Probably, um, in re it was probably um, very much supported by the more heretical Christians at the time, but nonetheless used by Christians. And it applied to Jesus in the Quran. This later got reinterpreted to an Arabian prophet. Vestiges of the earlier meaning are still evident in the Islamic traditions that refer to Adam being created from the light of Muhammad. And that's where we're at now. So that's that's basically the big picture. Um, I hope any Muslims who are watching this will actually really grasp what I am I'm trying to convey to you in terms of a fresh understanding, an understanding of what really went on in the 7th century and what produced the Qur'an. So we are dealing with writers of the Qur'an who didn't have an Arabian prophet from Mecca in mind at all. They had Jesus in mind, and we've seen lots of evidence for that right through this presentation. So hopefully you can grasp you know, the meaning and the, the context and the, the evolution of this over a number of centuries and perhaps it will be a wake-up call that you can realize that actually you've been lied to essentially maybe not maybe it's not been a conscious lie but you've been told an untruth and hopefully this will be um, a way by which you can get free of that okay and i wish you all the best in that endeavor all the best thank you all for watching and see you all very soon bye bye